Move on with uh, Matt Edwards. He's going to come say hi. I want to let everybody that, that has kids across the way that they're going to be finishing up at 4 o'clock. We're kind of cutting it close. Um, so please don't forget to go grab them. <laughs> so the sinners need to go home. But um, Mark, can you help uh, Matt um, get set up? Yep. And I'll introduce him a little bit. <laughs> so this is Matt. Matt is a behavior analyst in the Early Learning Center and Lower School Program at Virginia School for the Blind. So if you guys were on the tour yesterday, that's where, that's where Matt works. Um, his main job is to provide behavior support services to students with visual impairments and multiple disabilities. And that includes um, conducting functional vis uh, behavior assessments, writing intervention plans, and consulting with parents and team members. Um, He's also an orientation and mobility specialist. He's a jack of all trades. Um, he's a graduate of the University of yeah. Connecticut with a Bachelor of Arts in Communications and um, a, no, of Communication Sciences with a concentration in Human Development and Family Studies. He also has a Master's in Education and Vision Studies with a specialty in orientation and mobility from the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and has also gotten a graduate certificate in behavioral intervention and autism from the University of Massachusetts at Lowell. So here's Matt, and um, Matt will be around to answer questions yes. afterwards. Yeah. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for having me today. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and uh, I'm getting to meet all of you. Um, just a little background. Um, I went to University of Connecticut, um, majored in communications, and you know, I at that time I didn't really know what to, what I wanted to do, um, kind of going forward. Um, I was fortunate uh, to have my mother. Uh, she actually is currently an employee at Perkins School for the Blind as well. Um, and I grew up uh, meeting a lot of interesting students, um, and now adults as the years went along, um, and really got to kind of know how um, students at the time with uh, that were blind or visually impaired kind of were able to function. Um, and one of the uh, biggest um, things that kind of amazed me was um, how, uh, you know, people uh, at a young age, a developmental age, uh, were able to kind of navigate in the environment with a visual impairment. Um, and as, as the years went along, I, uh, as I graduated college, I um, ended up becoming an employee here at Perkins School for the Blind, and I was fortunate enough to meet a lot of new staff. Um, build a lot of relationships with students, and to eventually kind of go into um, uh, studies to uh, really learn about um, orientation mobility and um, uh, uh, behavior supports as well. So here I'm talking about the behavior supports for students with visual impairments and multiple disabilities. So at Perkins, I'm a behavior analyst. Um, and kind of what we do here at Perkins is we provide behavior supports uh, for students um, from an uh, uh, early age of three years old in preschool up to um, well into high school. Now my program individualized more for the younger children preschool up to um, kind of the elementary school age. And it's really important because the um, they're really develop they're uh, developing um, in a number of ways, and we provide a lot of support services, not just behavior supports, but occupational therapy, physical therapy, um, speech, and long, uh, speech and language pathology. So we have a, a very strong team that really we work collaboratively together um, to, to provide the best supports um, for each of our students. Um, and here we, you know, we, we provide a lot of the teacher uh, support and consultation services. Uh, my job, too, is to observe uh, students in the classroom setting, uh, push in services if they need any support, conduct uh, functional behavior assessments, um, finding the function of the behavior to really help um, determine uh, what the best way to approach that certain, what, whatever behavior that is, as well as creating behavior support plans uh, based on the findings of the FBA. Uh, tracking data. Data is very important, uh, not just for myself, not for, just for the teachers, but uh, for neur neurologists, um, family members. It's, it's really important to kind of see any trends that we might be able to depict at the time um, and over, over time as well. IEP planning meetings um, is a big part 
in helping to determine um, really the importance of what what goals um, are going to be set uh, behaviorally in other areas uh, for the student at the time. And really uh, consulting uh, with parents, nurses, neurologists, as I said, speech therapists. Um, you know, behavior is communication. It's uh, it's a very um, important time uh, for these these students as they are working on their communication, communication skills. Um, number of students not only are just visually impaired but have um, other multiple disabilities including um, autism spectrum disorder. And we're really modeling certain ways to teach them appropriate language and communication skills that will hopefully uh, develop um, into an um, important time of their life to so when they're older, when they graduate high school and they go into college or other areas. Um, getting into a job placement, really, it's a, a very important time for them. <clears throat> um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, an integrated approach to understanding some behavioral challenges. Um, you know, it, the Asian developmental level uh, for these students, um, for some of my students that I work with, are, it's very important to really work on the developmental expectations. Um, for some of my students that I work with here, they, um, they're developmentally younger than their actual age. Um, so in, in terms of what we do as a team, um, not just the behavior support team that we have, but really getting the whole team approach of the OTs, PTs, um, speech pathologists, psychologists, really to build on a certain level of communication that really builds on the functional communication to express certain wants and needs. And um, this, this is really um, an important part that isn't just what we work on here at school, but ideally keeping a consistent routine, a consistent structured routine that translates from home to school um, and vice versa. So some of the behavior needs. Um, why do our students at Perkins uh, present with behavioral challenges? Um, most of this is because the, the level of uh, developmental functioning. Um, they have language and um, communication deficit skills, so we're really modeling on certain uh, ways to model um, behavior approaches, emotional regulation uh, skills. And you know some of these include uh, neurological impairments, autism, as I said, ADHD. And you know, a lot of our students here are um, uh, born with uh, trauma, medical or for other reasons. So we kind of have a wide range of um, students who are totally blind, some who are visually impaired, some do have some functional vision. So in terms of communication that we really build on um, certain communication, uh, voice output communication devices, um, certain switches that for students that are nonverbal, we, their voice is through a certain device that they really um, are learning in a way they, we help to kind of model and communicate um, what they want to expect and what, what they want to say. So we're really giving them a voice. We're giving them the ways to communicate their behaviors. Uh, here we, uh, behavior data is very important. Um, not just for myself, but really uh, for um, neurologists uh, and nurses, teachers, um, to really look at um, if our interventions are effective or not. And some of this is easier said than done. Um, we develop certain plans, behavior plans, around what we think um, could best suit the student at the time. Sometimes we kind of, it's trial and error. Certain things work, certain things don't. Um, so some of this is really uh, having such a strong team to really get the input on you know, how their day is going, not just in the classroom, but in certain outside therapies at home, other areas of the environment, that it's really important to you know, track the behaviors, track accurate behaviors over a period of time, um, and really kind of reevaluate after an annual IEP meeting to really develop a certain uh, you know, goal, whether it's just behavior or other areas that um, kind of interrelate to each other. As I mentioned uh, before, the functional behavior assessments, known as FBA, here we uh, determine usually the four major functions of what a behavior is. Um, intention maintained, so that could 
be someone seeking attention from uh, someone, uh, trying to evoke a reaction from someone, escape maintained behavior. Um, some of this you might see children avoiding, avoiding work tasks or um, avoiding any demands placed on them. Access to tangibles or items. Um, they, they want access to a certain item or preferred activity. Automatic reinforcement. So some of this includes self-stimulatory uh, behaviors. Um, clapping, handshaking, jumping up and down. Um, and once uh, we determined uh, what the function or, or multiple functions of the behavior is, there we can help develop a behavior support plan. Um, and our behavior support plans are written for the school. And some of the uh, behavior analysts that work more in the home setting develop their own plans. Ideally, kind of what I would like to see um, overall is the consistency across multiple settings. Um, and for our kids uh, here at Perkins um, and other schools too, in the public schools uh, where I also work with um, in kind of a different uh, profession, that's the consistency and the routine building that's so important at, at their age too, that really following through and develop, developing um, certain supports, a positive behavior support plan um, is really what we like to see of a team collaboration, a team effort, getting input from all different areas. And here, the behavior plans aren't set in stone for a full year for their IP. This behaviors are changing, um, so behavior support plans are also changing. And you know, this is kind of important. We we try some strategies that work. Some might not work. Um, we we might need to revise. So that's kind of where where we're set for the behavior plans. The the kids change. You know, everyone changes. Um, so we might need you know, just to just kind of adapt to what we think is best for them. The school and home collaboration is very important, as I said. Um, kind of the benefits of collaborating with the in-home behavior analysts are, are very important because uh, a lot of the skills that we work on at Perkins and a number of schools can be carried over to the home setting. So that includes you know, behavior regulation, um, working on any self-care skills, even just brushing teeth, um, washing the hands, some, some of the things that you might think is very simple but for our kids that are really developing um, a, or an area of uh, development, that they, they need that consistency across multiple settings and not just in school. Um, as I said, routine building is so important for our, for our students. Um, and just like any, any of us, we, we, we wake up, we have a routine going to work. You know, we eat breakfast, take a shower, go to work, come back, relax. You know, for our kids, you have to kind of think of where, where they fit. Um, and some of the natural demands that we place on our kids at school, granted they're in a learning setting, um, we have to be cognizant of how they, how they think, um, how their routine is. And we want to make their, their routine as consistent as possible each day. Um, at the same uh, area, as they get older, really being flexible on the routine. If their routine changes, kind of thinking of certain ways that um, behaviorally they can uh, work on and not become you know, upset or uh, show any other the negative behaviors. So behavioral considerations for students with visual impairments. Um, access to visual cues in their environment is limited. Um, access to social cues, so some of us you know, looking at facial expressions is limited as well. So we really need to provide certain alternative strategies, um, creating schedules, giving them a choice to make making even simple free time choices, really giving them the voice to make a decision. Even if our natural demands, we want them to do something as they're learning, really giving them the voice to communicate in a, well, uh, in a way that we're respecting what they say. Um, but we're giving them multiple options and the chance to communicate and really developing that skill that will hopefully kind of lessen some of the behaviors that we see um, at that age. So ABA approaches with visual impairment. Now, so a lot of the traditional ABA approaches, you know, back when I was in school, incorporating using visuals. Now, for students with, with vision, visuals are very helpful with pictures, picture symbols, print. Um, but kind of what a lot of my students that have no vision or have um, very little functional vision is we need to find other ways to help them um, use uh, certain, we, we need to involve um, kind of other strategies that um, aren't visual 
Um, this can be done through developing just a whole language approach, re real life experiences. Uh, here at Perkins, we, we don't necessarily do the discrete trial um, approach, discrete trial training, um, but some of these we do individualize for our certain students that do provide structure, do provide repetition. Um, and these are, a lot of these strategies are based on the tr traditional ABA approaches. Um, so I incorporated uh, a universal design approach um, based on certain behaviors that we use here at school that can also be carried over to the home setting. Um, and here I kind of um, categorize it under the green as calm, yellow as an agitated or becoming a little more um, agitated and escalating escalated to when they get to um, what to do when they get to a certain um, situation. So I'm going to talk about a little about the green strategies on what you can do and kind of picking up the antecedents on what to hopefully prevent um, certain things from happening. So the, some of these goals and what we follow for the green strategies as we categorize them um, really enrich a school environment. So we incorporate this throughout their whole day, not just in the classroom, but it's, it's throughout throughout their whole day. So it can be other outside therapies, it can be in, in the classroom. This could also be carried at home as well. Um, really maintain a strong working relationship between staff and students. So it's really important to build a relationship with our students, get to know them. What do they want? What do they expect? How can we help provide them to the best of their ability? We want our students to maintain a calm, uh, calm behavior, lack of disruptive behaviors, engage, be compliant, and we have a, this can be available through just simple schedules, um, communication, uh, simple reward systems that we use as well. Plan ahead. It's really important to be prepared as we all do each day. Be prepared um, for, for our students to set them up for success. You know, we don't want our students to, um, we, don't want, we don't want to miss anything with our students. Uh, we, we need the necessary materials that they need available. Be proactive. It's very important. Um, consider any environmental um, arrangements. Uh, you know, things, things change, schedules change for our students that come in. Teachers could be out. It's really important to plan ahead, have a backup, um, and simple things that we kind of all naturally do. Um, offer choices. This is really important for our students. We just offer choices to really build their communication level. Give them certain things that they enjoy. We, we, school has to be enjoyable for our kids. Um, even though we're naturally placing demands on them, they're, they're learning. We want them to feel comfortable in their setting. We want them to be able to communicate their wants and needs. If they're unhappy with what they're doing, okay, let's, let's express that. Express that by signing finished, express that by saying no, um, express that by hitting a switch and saying no. You know, we, we, they're communicating what they want to do. It's really important for our kids. Um, as I said, you, the schedules we have, um, we have a tactile symbol schedules, which um, at the end I have some, um, some examples of that. Braille schedules for our students that um, are learning Braille or, or no Braille. Um, pictures for some of our students that do have some uh, uh, functional vision, um, some pictures are, are helpful. Um, text, calendar systems, we kind of have an unlimited uh, use of certain schedules that we help adapt to each of our students. Schedule breaks. Breaks are important. We all need breaks throughout the day. Um, give them the option to, to choose to, make, to take a break. You know, if, if we don't want to push them too much that they get to a certain level, offer them a break in their schedule. Frequent breaks can help reduce, reduce uh, resistance and less preferred activities. Really know what your student is expecting. Um, limit downtime. It, you know, a lot of, a lot of what we work um, on with our students is a simple waiting. Um, taking turns waiting that you might not think is that hard for us, but you know, you think of um, when someone that doesn't have vision and doesn't have a way to necessarily communicate as I do right here. 
they need to uh, realize that you know, turn taking and simple communication to wait um, is really essential part to help them develop um, when they get to an older age. Uh, we have many use of re reward systems. Uh, this can help really improve relationships with students and staff, um, create a better school experience, enhance the learning. Um, we have a wide range of um, complex, uh, complexity available, so we have simple edible reward systems, um, iPads, uh, token economy money so we have for our students we have certain jobs that they do where they earn money um, and they can really pool their money in to uh, buy something so when they t we take them out to the grocery store or a certain certain place that they enjoy we're really kind of following through with what they earned um, and it's it's essential and staying positive you know this presentation is based on positive behavior supports us staff parents family siblings, we really need to stay positive. And our natural reactions, negative statements, don't do this, don't do that, we all get caught in that. Really staying positive and focusing on what they're doing well. It's really important. Um, body language, tone of voice. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, agitated, and I'll go through these slides pretty quickly. Um, once they get to the kind of more of an agitated level above uh, the the green strategies really teach appropriate behaviors and really working on de-escalating the situation of certain behaviors that we don't like to see. So some of this might be include whining, complaining, non-compliance, perseveration on a certain item or toy. And with this available uh, availability through preferred items, through a schedule, communication, simple reward system, as I mentioned before. Remind them of their expectations. What are they going to do? You know, what are the rules? Reward systems, again, uh, very important, you know, reviewing what are they earning. If they complete this task, you get access to a preferred song or blank. <clears throat> Prompt communication, um, really just continuing to work on the communication. What are their, so the first signs of agitation, really? Identifying the needs and prompt appropriate behaviors at the time. Intervene early, really focusing on intervening before the situation gets to more intense level. And in the fortunate event, it does get to a more escalated as it categorizes into the red level. Um, we really want our students and any of the children to be safe, staff safe, students safe. Attempt to de-escalate the situation without reinforcing inappropriate behavior. Um, this can include extreme emotional distress, crying, agitation, self-injury, uh, property destruction. And you know, we as staff have to prepare and really work and collaborate on teamwork and carry materials and enhance the environment that fits best for them to hopefully um, de-escalate some of these um, situations that we do experience every once in a while. Um, limit the interactions, you know, don't negotiate with, with the student at the time really. Um, uh, one, one of my coworkers, uh, the number of words you use equals the age of the student. Um, really just keeping, keeping talking minimal, um, really following through with a behavior plan um, is really essential that naturally everyone kind of does at the home setting and school. Minimizing the reinforcement of problem behavior, so limiting preferred items, limiting preferred attention, um, and opportunities for students that control the environment. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, communication is so key for our students. Um, Number our students use the voice output communication devices that are hooked up through switches and connected through um, an iPad that kind of gives them the voice to make a, a choice. We have a great program called Go Talk Now that um, we as staff can help develop a certain page of their wants and needs or certain communication level um, where they can make a choice and they can communicate. If they don't have a voice, their voice is through here. So they do have a voice overall. Switch scanning um, is very important as well. Tangible symbols for our students. Sign language as well. And high tech and low devices. Um, so for some of our students that do have some vision, uh, we use some major, Mayor Johnson symbols. There's hundreds and hundreds of symbols, but these are just some examples um, that we do have for our kids. Um, so this is an example of a switch some of our students use. It's called the Big Mac switch. Um, we help 
we um, uh, communicate, they communicate by pressing the button. Uh, the staff um, uh, um, records a voice. So if they uh, need a break, we record, I need a break. And once that's recorded, they hit the switch. If they think they need a break, they hit the switch. There's a voice output saying, I need a break. And there's many, we have hundreds and hundreds of different um, examples, but this is just one of them that we use. These are some examples of our tactile um, symbols. So a number of our students have um, uh, classes, just like uh, we do in uh, school. But here at Perkins, we have uh, music therapy, occupational therapy, PT, and these symbols are um, things that you can, they're, they're tactile, you can feel the, the difference. Um, and for some of our students that do have, uh, that, that can read Braille, we, uh, we um, make some Braille under so they can also read it as well. Um, so for some of our students that uh, need to, you know, work on some of their, uh, the behavior that a lot of my caseload has is um, they, they tap the symbol if they need a break, finish, they can sign finish. Um, or they can hit the symbol finished. Calm body is another uh, useful symbol that we use. And here at Perkins, we virtually can create any symbol that we need based on individual needs of each student. Simple yes, no symbols uh, are, are very important for our kids as well. Um, this is an example of a communication device that one of my students uses. <clears throat> um, here you can see the, uh, the four different qu uh, quadrants, uh, they're tactile symbols. And when they press that, um, a voice, it's a voice output switch. So on top left, um, the symbol that is, uh, it's, um, I want something different. Um, there's a bathroom symbol, a yes and no, that um, a few of our students are trialing at the moment. This is just an example of like a simple rule board or communication symbols that some of our students carry around with them each um, each transition. So if they're going from the classroom to say music, they travel with the symbol. So um, if they do need to communicate that they're finished with this activity at the time, they can let us know. If we ask them the question, yes. Uh, if they, we ask them a question, no. Um, this is an example of a student communicating and using their, sim uh, their symbols. And this is just another example of um, some of the uh, uh, schedule symbols that we use. Um, and I have, I know we're really short on time here. Um, I have a number of different symbols uh, in my bag. If anyone wants to check it out, I have a couple switches that we use. Um, and I believe I'll be taking questions after this. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. As a fellow communications major, I do uh, very much realize that communication is the key to success in many ways. And therefore, I actually want to ask your opinion on a certain behavior that is not only present in children, and, but also in some adults that happen to be blind. Mm -hmm. And that is, also, that is actually also present in all levels of cognitive uh, functioning. Mm -hmm. So I think it affects us all. And I'm talking here about blindisms. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the rocking back and forth. I'm talking about certain head movements, about this thing with the, the hand flapping. And actually, I, am, I, want to, I wanted to ask what your opinion is, if we, can still, if we can do something about it, what it is you do about it in Perkins uh, School, and what it is we can do about it at home still, because I think it's very important that we try and um, get rid of them as much as possible, since they very much influence our uh, yeah, impressions when it comes to professional level and uh, social functioning into the side of the world. Yeah, thank you for bringing up that. Um, you know, for, for some of our students that are congenitally blind, um, you know, naturally uh, experience some of the things that you just mentioned, the hand flapping, the rocking, the shaking. Um, you know, at Perkins, and uh, not just at Perkins, but just um, kind of in general, is really finding the, the certain functions of the behavior. And it's not necessarily a behavior. It's... Um, 
<laughs> it's um, working with uh, the the OT and seeing if, if it is uh, more of a sensory type thing, um, and working together to create a, a program and an individual need that can be addressed through a behavior support program or just any general guidelines that um, really depicting on because that behavior is happening, if we can introduce uh, certain other professions that include the OT sensory skills working on kind of self-regulation. Um, so it, it's, it's more of a, it's, it's a work in progress that we, I see, and I'm going to say all my students. Um, and as you mentioned that, you know, it, it, it's something that um, isn't just addressed at a, a, an age, a, a children's age, you know, it can be something that is really worked on throughout uh, someone's life. Um, and I, I think it's important to really get the different perspectives on um, from a behavior standpoint and then from more of a sensory, the occupational therapy um, uh, uh, psych, uh, psychology as well. Um, so I think it, it involves more um, than just, uh, you know, behavior, behavior analyst. Um, it's more of a, bit, a team approach that, you know, we, we work on, we try to um, develop and uh, treat at, at a young age to helpfully develop those skills that can transfer over to um, when they do get older. Just a follow up on this question. Uh, what can, what advice can you give us to us parents about how to manage that, right? How to in the in the home environment, what is what are some strategies? Is it about about reward versus punishment, or is it about, or is it normal at, at, until certain age, or? Mm. Um, no, you bring up a a, a great question. The Generally, a lot of uh, my students' parents don't necessarily have a, a behavior background. So kind of what uh, we involve is giving certain um, strategies to use. And as I kind of mentioned in the universal strategies that aren't just being worked on at school, but that can be on a home setting. Um, certain things that we feel at Perkins and just in my experiences in working in schools, creating a, a positive support. And it, it, it depends on the certain student and what their communication needs are. I, I think it's important to um, really involve a, a consistent approach. And sometimes these approaches, they might not work. Um, that doesn't mean behaviors can't be treated. It's certain kind of, as I mentioned before, it's like a trial and error. But in terms of shaping behavior or treating a behavior at the time, it, it might take a little while to work. Um, and for me, being at a school setting, we, we develop these plans based on what happens at school. This doesn't always transition to the home because it's, it's different people um, and it's a different environment. But there are some strategies that we like to see and, and for our, our students that have in-home behavior therapies that work with in-home behavior analysts to really build on a consistent approach between school and home that it might not always work, but it's keeping that consistency in the routine, as I mentioned before, it's really important for, our, for those kids. Like we've talked about, like, I mean, that my son's a rocker, and providing him appropriate places to rock, like a rocking chair, versus him just sitting in the chair at the kitchen yeah. table. And, yeah. no, I mean, but, uh, personally, I have the same problem. My, right. my, my son is a rocker, and he has a rocking chair, but, right. so now but he doesn't use it. <laughs> so, so the question is, how? what are the yeah. strategies that help me? Right, and, yeah. and so I need help at home, too, but, you know, oh, oh, I need help at home, too, but things that we've talked about, like working with his teacher, it's not safe to rock and eat. So, no, please don't rock, mm -hmm. Max. If you really need to rock, I need a break. We're, I need to move, let's go. So now we have like a rocking chair in every room. It doesn't always work, but, uh, you know, uh, little it, things like that. Yeah, what? And, and I think it's providing those opportunities that, you know, because Max and your child like to rock, we're not going to 
to get them to not rock. It's something, it's a self-stimulatory behavior that they need, you can't just totally get rid of it. Um, providing certain appropriate areas to do that in a way and then working kind of fading the behavior out. Um, and it's, that's kind of more of a general sense and it's really individualized on the student. Um, but, you know, but what we, what we work on here at school, the positive outcomes that we see, we share in a home setting too that we know has worked at school. It could work at home. It's, it doesn't always work that way, but it's something that we know can work. Um, and that's, that's through having a support team, a support team at home as well, keeping a, a consistent approach on what you're doing what your wife's doing, what your other children are doing, um, ev keeping everyone involved that it's really, it's a support team at school, it's a support team at home. They're really, we're really working on together to, to provide the best experience for them. And what you. worked for my son was um, when I noticed that he was flapping his hands or rocking, a lot of times it, he was in, involved in downtime. And so I actually, when he started flapping his hands, I gave him a Lego with the uh, six dots on each side. And I think that fe felt like Braille because he was learning Braille. And I noticed that all the energy was going into the Legos and the flapping stop. And then I, for the rocking, I noticed he loves to read. So I would give him his headphone, an audio book, and he would get into the story and he would stop rocking. So I would always try to find something to keep him engaged. Uh, to, to try to prevent that behavior. And she brings up a very good point that um, as much as sometimes downtime is important for our kids, it's uh, keeping a, a very structured routine, kind of always having something available for them to do. Um, and sometimes just them sitting in a rocking chair might be necessary what they need. But that can increase some of their self-stimulatory behavior, the hand flapping, the clapping. Um, keeping certain items if they're holding something that might limit to them. Um, so there's many areas that kind of are really catered to the individual, but um, you know, for, for here at, at school, we, we like to see things that work, really building on that in appropriate settings that can carry over to home as well. Um, can I say something? Um, I think, and uh, when it, interesting thing is when you extinguish one self-stimulatory behavior, sometimes other behaviors crop up. So yeah. you think, wow, I got this rocking under control, and then they start biting their finger or something, and it's like, oh, my God. Yeah. So um, when Nathan was growing up, I mean, he, he, he still rocks some, but we had this kind of secret code. I learned this at one of my conferences I went to, and when he was a teenager, it would annoy the hell out of him, and I think I still do, but, you know, so if I see him, because you can't always have a rocking chair. I mean, we have lots of rocking chairs. We, we, we're thinking about having a rockathon to support Nori disease, because I'm serious. I'm thinking yeah. if we do a collective rockathon, we could, we could really make some big money, and so well, that's, that's kind of a positive, you know, yeah. spin. Right. But um, so in public, you, you know, you, you kind of have to be kind of sensitive. So, you know, I would, somebody said, you know, just put your hand gently on the person's shoulder. So like if you're a child, so I would just, you know, and then when he was a teenager, he would go, get, get off me. What are you doing? You know, but so now, you know, if I just go like this, um, nobody else knows what you're doing. Nobody, you know, um, but your child you know, when they get to the cognitive level that they can understand, um, it really has had an impact. And um, so, you know, and, and also, I think siblings can make a big impact because he has an older brother. And he's like, I'm not taking you anywhere if you rock. You know, and yeah. so, I mean, really, it's like, my friends don't rock. And so, a lot of times, they listen to a sibling more than the nagging parent. Right. And when maybe when they get older, y you do have to say what's socially kind of appropriate hmm. um, because a lot of times when he was little, he didn't realize he was rocking. He didn't realize that he was, you know, he just yeah. right. didn't realize. And you, know, you bring up some great points. And, you know, at home and in school, it, they're generally a, a very controlled environment. We can create an environment that caters to our student and what they need. You know, when you go out into the public or certain areas that you can't necessarily control, 
that's a little harder. And I think developmentally at a young age that we work on our students provide appropriate behaviors to get them ready to when they're older. And some of that is really based on the, the family, the family influence, the siblings, and kind of what they do, what things that are working at home. It's just as important to kind of communicate what works at school and at home as well. And, you know, there, there's certain things that um, we do to kind of adapt the environment that, that help our students. Um, but some of that is taking them out to do grocery shopping or taking them out for a field trip they're not just, they're getting out of their environment. They're getting out into something that it's essential to, as you think when they get older, to have a job or go to college. This is what they're going to do. They're not just going to be in a classroom. We're, we're building these skills and addressing these uh, behaviors, the self-stimulatory behaviors um, and other behaviors as well to hopefully develop um, them to making good choices, making positive choices, and rewarding them with choices to when they do go out into the field, um, when they do go out into public, go into the store, that um, there are certain strategies that they might need to remind themselves on or you remind them on as well. Um, thank you. Yep. Well, more a comment than a question. Um, for what worked for me or what is working for me, and what I hear um, in the, the public, in the audience for now, is that it all comes down all, a little bit to um, actually just playing out conditioning and positive reinforcement strategies um, and inducing social learning. If I look at families, oh, I'm not going to take you out if you are rocking. Yeah. It's very, um, you know, it's very, it's, it's very easy to learn that way because it's a peer uh, peer learning is a very important strategy and for what for me worked for me uh, personally is two things first is um, because I did this at a, a later age uh, but first is awareness of the of the blindism itself and the fact that it is a problem is very important at least for me it was it's purely a personal account and the second thing that was important uh, for me was indeed uh, Self-reinforcement, I do it sometimes. If I don't rock for, I don't know, two hours, then I have a little treat for myself, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that, <laughs> thank you very much. It, you know, for um, our, our students that we want to not only just give them a voice, but we want to hear for them, from them as well. What's, what's working? What worked for you last year? what works for you now that could be totally different um, and certain things that worked for you might work for another individual um, so it's really it, we're not just working on communication with just my students and vice versa it, it's we like to hear what everyone is saying what things are working creating that positive atmosphere that positive support but sometimes there needs to be some consequences that like you said you know you you're not going to go out until you stop rocking. You know, it's certain things that do need to be set in stone. I think just natural demands that we all kind of give to our children, our students. Um, they it it gets to a point where, you know, sometimes uh, these demands are what's going to happen in real life. Um, but we try to really work on certain things and kind of giving them a voice to they can communicate what they want, what they need. Um, so that when they do get into that situation, they're kind of prepared to uh, work on the strategies that they've been taught, that they know works. Um, Self-efficacy as well, creating um, really a, more of like a universal approach to the, the social setting on what you experience when you go out with your friends, when you meet new people. Um, certain things that you might not experience at um, you know, a preschool or um, elementary school level, but that's really important to when you get into more of a high school and college and post-life. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's very important. I, hey, my uh, question is more related to the younger population that you work with, mm -hmm. so I actually professionally and personally understand both sides of this and um, work with the zero to three population, and my question really is, do you tend to utilize the data and information from organizations like early intervention when you're starting your IEP process do you have a transition process that you go through in your school in particular 
Um, and with, in regard to behavior specifically, do you really utilize the information from those professionals and the parents in setting up the initial IEP plan? So that that's um, you, know, you bring up a, a, a great point. We um, you know for some of our students, uh, they do come in at a very early age that went through earlier intervention. Um, I, I think for for anyone you could you can work on behaviors and everyone nat naturally does with a with a very young child. Um, and if you do have those supports available to really help that transition process to preschool or to elementary school and really having that support staff, any information, any older information that you have is really essential for us. And sometimes it's not always that easy. We have a number of students from, you know, outside the U.S. that um, are, uh, you know, we, we don't always get those records. Um, so sometimes we kind of have to start from scratch and see what's working or not. But kind of the more, more we are, um, the more you know, communication we get from the parents or other behavior analysts, um, other professionals, is essential in, her, in terms of kind of developing a plan that we can send in stone from day one. We're not waiting till two, two months out. Sometimes it happens because we need, kind of need to see how those behaviors kind of develop in a certain setting. Um, but any of the information that we look at the data on, if any data has been collected in certain settings that we can see, that hopefully we see a trend that transitions to the school or even in home. Thank you. Thanks. I have a comment. I guess it's a concern. I know a couple people who have blind children who I think were misdiagnosed as having also being on the autism spectrum because of the, I'll call them blindisms or repetitive, whatever, self-stimulatory behaviors. And I'm, I'm, I kind of, I would, I don't think there's any study out there, um, but I'm really concerned that maybe some of our children are being diagnosed early with, you know, somewhere on the spectrum because people, you know, physicians, whatever, I mean, they really don't understand blindness and some of these behaviors. And so I guess my thing is to caution people when they say, oh, you know, your kid is flapping, he's poking the same thing, you know, over and over, he's doing this repetitive stuff, you know, he's tactically defensive, he's got echolalic speech. Mm -hmm. um, some of those are some criteria, not, not criteria, I don't want to say that. Um, what's the word I want to say? Steps. Characteristics, maybe, of blindness. But, it, but it's easy for a parent, especially if it's your first child, to say, oh, my gosh, my child must have autism, you know. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that more than, um, than I want to, and I'm really concerned. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I jump in there? Because I think that, that uh, we're in a situ situation very similar to that. Um, Mackenzie um, has a lot of those behaviors. And after having spoken to his pediatrician, um, she's, very, um, she's very aware of the fact that her experience isn't with blind children. And... Uh, she did end up diagnosing him as what she says uh, is being a high functioning on the autism spectrum um, because of those things. Her reasoning was um, that uh, in Canada, specifically in Ontario, we are, um, kids on the autism spectrum are able to get ABA therapy for free until 18 years of age if they're diagnosed. Um, so without that, her, her reasoning was um, you know, he might not be autistic, uh, but we could wait until down the road and we could say, oh, shoot, all those years he could have been having ABA therapy, which will benefit him whether he's autistic or not, um, and we, miss, we, we drop the ball. I think the key to it for me as an educator it was really difficult for that, and I even haven't formally shared that documentation with his school at this point. Um, I at some point may do that, but I think as parents we need to be very cognitive of, er, conscious of that fact when, when a diagnosis like that is put in place, that it is not um, some sort of um, defining characteristic of what our child's future is going to be or anything like that, because like any other diagnosis, there are a lot of people with autism diagnoses that are very high functioning in life and successful, and we still just need to advocate regardless of, of that diagnosis um, and, and, you know, get whatever we can for our kids to make sure they're successful. But I think 
again, as an educator, I see a lot of kids who will, um, or a lot of parents who will get a diagnosis like that and go, oh, yeah. that's it. Like, we're done. This is going to define my child. And, and not taking that attitude, taking the other side of it and saying, okay, let's work with this. Let's do what we can to get to where we can get, right? And I understand, too, that, you know, you, you do have access to more services. Yeah. On the flip side of that, it's not only parents that may lower their expectations. True. And I'm not talking about you as an educator, but it's educators. Of course. And so that's, that's a really slippery slope, too. Which that, is why I haven't yet formally handed right, that over. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And I have several friends who are in your situation, like that their yeah. child is on the autism spectrum, but they're like, we're not going to share it with the school yet. Yeah. Because they don't want, and I'm not. I'm just saying. You know, I'm just saying. Educators. I'm not yeah. going across the board. Yeah, no, but you yeah. all know what I mean. Your parents. You, know, right. you know, very cautious. To they don't want to have anybody lower their expectations. And, and that that comes a lot uh, up a lot with a lot of my students' parents as well. Um, you know, in, in Massachusetts, uh, having that diagnosis of autism, we do have more services provided. Um, I think because. A lot of my students have multiple disabilities, not just autism, visual impairments. Um, I, I think some of the, the trauma and some of the things and just talking to the parents that they look at the, their child's diagnoses and see all the stuff that they have. Um, but being in at least Perkins and a certain number of the public schools I work with, that we we treat our students um, in a in a very similar way that we try to address um, and for our, my students that are blind and visually impaired that we try to incorporate doesn't matter if they have autism or any other um, disabilities that we try to make having the more people available to help for support not just family members but just support staff for for school. I think the better off our students will be as they get older. Um, and for a lot of my students have a diagnosis of autism, some are, have a high functioning autism, but it, it's their visual impairment that kind of, I wouldn't say take, takes precedent, but um, in terms of looking at the different levels of autism, that um, it kind of, it, there's a wide array of different um, kind of areas that we kind of focus on, but having that visual diagnosis um, is really important because some of these strategies that just talking to some of the AB therapists that don't have a background in visual impairment, a lot of it is kind of based visually, um, and it does work for those students. But when they when they can't see or they uh, don't have that functional vision to use to make choices that you know um, that we uh, for some of us that can see that we. We need to have alternative, strat uh, alternative strategies that help support them. Um, and that, that, just, that comes up a lot for just speaking to families that kind of come in, uh, especially new families that are coming from public schools or even from you know, earlier intervention that they, it, it, because a lot of our kids are so medically complex, um, there's, there's a lot involved. And I think some of that um, can really affect kind of the state on how some of the parents feel. Um, and it, it can be a little upsetting, but kind of knowing that we as staff um, are here to support your student, your child, in a way that will help them develop um, communicatively, um, behaviorally, at an older age. So. Um, this is a question more related to, um, I guess, uh, communication also tied in with behavior so so a lot of times I think poor behavior or behavior that you want to correct is related to your child not being able to communicate effectively so my son is three and he's he's used those Big Mac buttons probably for the past two years now but you know, communication is still an issue. He's nonverbal. There's a lot of frustration on his end, on our end, trying to figure out what the heck he wants. So how do you know when your child is ready to move on to, like, a more sophisticated type of communication device? Mm -hmm. Do you have any I, – I know you're not a speech therapist, but do you have any yeah. insight? No, um, and that that comes up a lot as well, The and just being involved in IP meetings that – Sometimes 
certain devices don't work for um, an uh, individual. And trying new devices, granted, nowadays we have many augmentative communication devices that um, are available. It's not just a handful. We have up to you know hundreds of devices that we can use. Um, I think trialing these devices at an early age is really important to kind of seeing what their level is and kind of understanding um, how they can communicate. Um, working with a speech pathologist, we really see what what's the what's the best way they communicate in a functional way, um, and some of that we see through behaviors. But if they can. Ha, uh, use a yes no switch and say yes or, or no I don't want to do this that's one way to kind of shape behavior and some of the uh, speech and language pathologists really they're it, we're kind of at a at an age three to you know even 15 years old that we're trying these new devices that we think will work best and it's not just it is recommended through the speech pathologist but there it's kind of a big team approach on trialing on certain device that Okay, it's working in the classroom. I think what the more, more frustrating thing is that in talking to parents and even other staff is sometimes these devices take, take a long time to really, uh, for the student to get used to it. Um, so I think the biggest thing is I think being patient on trying a device and not going th through too many devices at once in one year um, because something might click in your child's mind that oh, this is one way to communicate effectively. Um, and it's kind of easier said than done. And I, I know a lot of, a lot of um, parents kind of go back and forth on what devices they think is best, what they think um, kind of benefits uh, their child at home. And I think one of the biggest things is really collaborating kind of with um, families. Like, what do you think works best with their communication? And then kind of bringing that expertise on a professional level on what some of these devices are that we think will be useful for our kids. Um, but that, that, that com comes up a lot and people kind of go back and forth with certain communication devices and, you know, I, I think giving it time and, and especially at a young age, I think that's really important starting three years old, you know, really young. Communicating, you know, trying to change up a communication device at 15 or later, it's going to be a little harder. Um, but really giving them the voice, giving them the experience to kind of um, communicate in, in real life. So. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you, Matt, so much. We really appreciate it. Okay. All right, guys, we're done for the day.